project. Yeah. And it's really nice to have you guys. Did I meet some of you last year in Karachi? Maybe. Two years ago. So, I may have met. Yeah. Were any of you in the Karachi office two years ago? Uh, no, I don't think any of us were there. Yeah. Okay. I'm happy to have you here, sir. Uh, so Thank you. What's the museum like? It's uh, it's a digital space, so it's not a collection-based museum. We so, uh, yeah, but but uh, I thought that you know uh, Marby had designed rooms that were going to house you know parts of the collection and all of that. So that didn't happen. That has happened, right? Sorry. The museum isn't, didn't they didn't uh, Citizens Archive create a museum in Lahore? Yeah, Open yeah, the yeah, National History Museum. Yeah. yeah. And. So doesn't that have part of the permanent, that like the permanent collection of the archives sitting there? It or does. Is it, yeah. uh, uh, it is home to a part of our archive. So uh, the museum is curated using oral history audios and videos that we've collected in, under the project. And then the photographs used are also from the archive. And it's how much has the Punjab government spent here so far? Uh, we've tried to uh, kind of manage a good balance between the state narrative and the kind of, and the nuanced narrative that we want to uh, showcase. So I think you, you can be a better judge of it. Have you been to the museum? Well, wait until you start doing things like, you know, the 71 war and, uh, uh, yes. and other things that the army disputes. Yeah, it's um, always a challenge, but we try to push back as much as we can. When is, when has, has the oral history project actually started doing 71 and beyond, isn't that, yeah. that was what you all were working on a year and a half ago, I know that. Yeah, uh, so we've actually expanded the scope of the archive and we're also collecting narratives of second generation citizens, so those who can better comment on the political activities in the 50s, in the 60s, 70s, 80s and beyond. So yeah, yeah that is something that the project is focusing on now. So one of the people that you all should actually, I don't know, Chemi knows him, uh, but I don't think you all have interviewed him yet. Is um, Zia Isfahani, um, who's a, he's a former Pakistani ambassador. Uh, he was the ambassador to Italy. His family is the Isfahani family, and they are from Bangladesh. And he's from Dhaka actually. And he actually came here and never went back, and was actually has. I think he's been back twice since 1971, but most of his family is still back there. Um, and he has some really interesting perspectives on you know, the relationship between the East and the West and the war and the Falana and all that. Is he based in Karachi? In Karachi, yeah. I, I think the, uh, that it, and whatever that is mean, that main road into defense from Gizri Boulevard, whatever that, I can't remember the name of that. Place. I have no idea, but I think with the OHP team in Karachi can definitely connect with you on that. Yeah, well, I, mean, I keep giving Shami lists of names and she doesn't do much about it, so I'm, I've stopped making suggestions. I think it would be uh, more effective if you can just communicate with us directly. We'll get on it right away. Okay, so I'm telling you, so you can convey All right, perfect. I'll just, I'll convey to my colleagues in Karachi. I don't know who the acting Malia is. But she's, who else, uh, your participants, have they arrived yet? Yeah, so we have uh, the three of them here, and uh, with the rain, I'm not sure if the rest will be able to make it in time, but we're, we can start now. Okay. Um, so who is participating in, so the three of you are? Who uh, can... The three of these guys. Hi. So, um, so I'm not entirely exactly sure what the larger point of this dialogue is, except that you get to interact with somebody in Karachi as opposed to uh, people in Lahore, who I'm sure you interact with regularly, and on a subject of my choice. Um, and I thought human rights would be an interesting subject to talk about, especially given all of the, you know, all of the ways in which human rights are being violated in Pakistan right now um, and across the world, not just in Pakistan. Um, um, certainly, our neighbor to the north, China, um, is uh, suppressing and uh, repressing and uh, doing what it's been doing for the last, I guess, eight to seven years. Um, but not just there. I mean, I would say that there are very few, very few, and dwindling quickly pockets of um, communal pockets, communities in which um, human rights 
are respected in the spirit in which human rights were offered um, by the United Nations after World War II as a doctrine, not a doctrine of safeguarding human beings from governments um, and from each other, obviously. Um, but, the, but the spirit of what they did. So what do you know about the human rights? Uh, what do you know about human rights, about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and about the UN, United Nations Human Rights Doctrine? Uh, we have been like studying, being a student of political science about how UN works, how the world institution works, how the human rights declaration was declared, and what were the and at times how the human right uh, rights uh, is used as a, as a you know a sort of a reason even to invade other countries at times yes. so uh, so a lot of different dimensions that come along with it and, and along with also there is another thing too that is that when there is a debate between human rights and cultural rights at times so academically yes. Yes. at times so, so you there are a lot of things. in your political science courses in yes yes yes, yes. you have um, all right. Uh, so, have you? I mean, have you read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? From yes, have you read yes. that? That document I asked Malia to tell you all to read. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, but have you read it in class? Have you read it with fact with a professor or with fellow students or just for this? We we have read it in class or it, during our course time. Like we have read it. We have not like read it for this talk just prior. To uh, all right. So what? So what is a human right? That's human I guess is, the question one should ask. I think right? it is something that is inalienable and that is like something that every or each and every human being deserves, just by virtue of being a human. Yeah, but that's not how it's framed, right? It's not about deserving, right? Because if it was if it was deserving, that means that we have done something as human beings that merit the awarding of something called a human right. But that's not how human rights are framed at all, in fact. It's not about deserving. It's not about a reward. It's not about something that is bestowed on a human being by a government or a political or social entity, right? So what is it? It is inalienable, a sort of, like, it is yours. Yeah. It is mine. It is yours. And nobody, nobody can take it from me. And nobody can give it to me. But what happens in this world is at times those rights are snatched, at times those are curbed, at times there are certain limitations that are put on it. So, yes, and that we are we deal with governments and let's just try and define it. But let's try and define what it is first, because until we come up, with, until we have a working definition of what a human right is, right, you won't actually be able to expand out from that and talk about the ways in which that right if it is in fact truly inalienable. If inalienable has been undermined or abrogated or, or disrespected or ignored by political entities around the world. I'm not do we, I mean we shouldn't just talk about Pakistan. We should talk about this in a global context, right? So um so this I I just want to show you this book. This is uh, this is basically every international lawyer, jurist, right? Anybody who's involved in international law, this is one of their, one of these sort of basic handbooks. It's, it's Brownlee's uh, Documents of Human on Human Rights, and it includes, for the most part, every human rights declaration, covenant, convention, or treaty entered into by member states of the United Nations, and then supplemental sections on specific continental designations of rights. So there's the African, uh, the Council for Human Rights in Africa and their documents, and the European Council for Human Rights, their documents, and then the Asian and their documents, essentially. It's a huge, big, big, fat book, right? So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the beginning of something, right? The development of an entire body of law legal doctrine that governs the relationships of member states and remember this is member states of the united nations and the people that they govern right so if i went out on the street rasta tomorrow right and i'm driving down the road and i run over some poor hapless person crossing the road have i violated that person's human rights 
Have I? Yeah. Well, in a very fundamental way, yes. Right? But human rights law would say that that does not constitute a human rights violation. Why? That seems strange, right? You kill someone by running them over and human rights law says you haven't really violated their human rights or you haven't actually committed an act that is actionable by an international criminal court or a body of jurists who look at the ways in which individuals interact with each other within particular societies or across borders, right? So why is that the case? Why is if I kill, if I kill someone, why is that not a violation of their human rights? According to the law, according to the legal doctrine. Does it make any sense to you? Maybe I think because some of the basic fundamental freedoms or basic uh, hu human rights are codified by the states and governments and they regulate it by themselves and they don't call it a human right or something else. Yeah, that's close, but not quite. Or at the same time, it may be like uh, the United Nations, when they say human rights, they see it in a global context or from the perspective of global governance or something like that. It's not even quite that. <laughs> Just think about this for a second. Why, so, and this, I mean, if I go and sort of take over somebody's house, personally, go in, kabza karo their house, right? Or I encroach somebody's land, or I forcibly remove an individual child from school, or I force a child into labor, to, to work, and to work inordinately long hours, like 14 hours, 16 hours a day as a child, right? If I do, if I personally do any of those things, right, those do not constitute human rights violations. It's not just about murdering someone. Uh, I think the problem is because, because at times when systematically states are doing it, Across, uh, for, um, across populations, then they are termed as human rights violations at times. Or yes. when they are towards individuals, they are, for example, just crimes. Yes, exactly. that's exactly it, right? So there's a distinction to be made between a crime, crime committed by an individual within a society that is then punishable according to a set of laws that, are pre, that have been predetermined. Make sense, right? We have a penal code. It punishes murder, right? It punishes stealing, a theft. It punishes the squat encroachment on somebody else's property. There are laws, right, that govern certain things. Whether those laws are fully implemented or not is a different issue altogether. But the state has already put in place a penal code that governs and that governs or that limits, let me say, limits the behavior of individual citizens within a particular political unit, right? Limits their behaviors in order to protect other individuals within the state, right? So what is that law about? A law against murder, right? Is a law put in place to protect other individuals from your act, right? You do not have the freedom to go and murder someone. You do not have the freedom to go and steal. You do not have the freedom to go and encroach land. You, right? Do you make sense? Now, if, if those laws are there, right? But in, say, a particular domain, in a particular nation, right? Those laws are sy sy systemically, systematically not implemented, right? Suppose people kill, right? or certain groups of people kill, and they are exempted from the law, right? Does that constitute a human rights violation? Of course it does. Huh? Yeah, it does. It does. It does. Why it does? does it? Because now there's uh, a group of people that are being able to commit this violation. Not just about that, it's also something else. No, the it seems like state is an state's penal code is unable to protect its citizens. It which means that state is complacent, complacent in 
complicit complicit in the violent part of the organization of that certain community so it's really about the state that the state itself is not living up to its responsibility in relation to a set of laws that the state itself has enacted and legislated right but it is not implementing them or it is not implementing them fairly those laws fairly or equally across the board right central to human rights doctrine is that each human being individually is equal to any other human being right no matter their gender age class caste sexual orientation nationality religion ethnicity right none of those things that each individual has the same sets of rights as any other individual and you cannot deny one individual a set of rights right that you have conferred upon some other individual simply because of your individual prejudice yes right so when the state does not live up to its responsibility protecting the citizens of that state that's when human rights violations occur yes all right so in what ways i mean there's four of you right so one each one human rights rights violation currently ongoing in pakistan the current human rights violation where you know people are not able to get clean water it has also become one of the rights recently you know where there are like conferences people are talking about water not getting the clean water like all around the world and the idea that how you know soon we are going to run out of it and you know but is is the right to clean water is that an inalienable right is that a right that we that we possess right and is un inalienable means cannot be removed from cannot be made alien to yourself your body right your mind yeah is it But, why what the way wait so this for slowly why in pakistan all of you as students tend to do one thing right you tend to jump to a conclusion right without actually going through the very careful deliberate step by step argumentation the building of an argument right so that you have and you have a framework a structure on which to then put your place your conclusion right you have a foundation on which to build right so the point of going slowly is to do this step by step okay? why is water for example right yeah why is clean water why should clean water be the access to clean water an inalienable right is it the same thing as access to coca cola or miranda or whatever because it's a human need right you would just can't snatch your snatch this right away from you but since yeah it's like state's responsibility to give it to you but they are unable to do that so the, they're why just making this yeah no, but why is it the state's responsibility to give you access to clean water doesn't it, it, it the, the responsibility is not to give you clean water right it is not the state's responsibility to make sure that you have clean pani in your fridge or in a flask or a thermos sitting in your kitchen it is the state's responsibility to give you access which is slightly different right give you access means that you have the opportunity to access clean pani So yeah that is how they are making water a commodity now right under that but, access but, 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 yeah but, but we all have access to clean pani don't we not everyone has like you know let's talk about the kalala wala village for that matter a lot of villages out there you know are surrounded by the industrial areas and those people they have they have deformity issues out there and people think that it's this is some curse that they yes, are not getting clean water is water. Clean. but right is so let me uh, let me phrase this slightly different so if the state then provided right somehow or paid for nestle to come and deliver to each one of those people in that village a bottle of clean pani every week right would that be enough 
No, that's not enough. It should not be nationally. That state should be propagated. Right? That is the commodity that the yeah, state but, should. Yeah, but the state's paying for it. You're not paying for it. The state has then provided you access to clean money, has lived up to its responsibility, right? Yeah, all right, fine. If they're doing it, then well, we're state fine. is paying. State is also paying from our taxes. Yeah. Yes, which you're paying from your taxes, well, well, from the people who pay taxes, rather than paying from our yeah. taxes. Because you know yeah. that's another issue, yeah. right? But but the state has lived up to the letter of the right, right? The state has said, okay, this village does not have access to clean water, right? We will buy them water, clean water, and we will make sure that every household has enough. They've done they've done what they said they would do. That is living up to. But is there a larger issue that the state has not dealt with? Yeah, I'm coming towards it. Uh, now a lot, a lot of human rights issues coming towards in Pakistan, starting from what are going on currently right now, like what happened in Fata and the rise of PTM, what is what is happening in Gilgit Baltistan, what is happening in Balochistan, what has been going on in in many other places with minorities. <laughs> Look, there is no there. Nobody in here is a member of the military, right? There are no microphones in here, so be specific. Yeah. How do things you're saying? Yeah. What specifically are you? you know, what happened am, in China? What in Balochistan? Yeah, I am talk, talking about as far as Fata is concerned. So what happened there? We all know what happened during drone attacks. What happened during uh, landmines? How many Pashtuns, our own people, died there? They yeah. migrated from those places as IDPs. The drone attacks are separate from the yeah. land means, and they are separate yeah. from the yeah. occupation, right? Yeah, yeah, they, they are separate. But at the same time, they have been hitting the the TTP members or whatsoever. At the same time, they have been damaging the tribal people, which were Pakistanis too. So yeah. they have also been, uh, you know, have suffered as a form of collateral damage in that war. But so, it's more than just collateral damage, right? much more than that. Yes, what happened? Sure. What has happened to these particular regions? So, Gilgit, Baltistan, Balochistan, Fata. What has happened to these regions over the course of the last 71 years? Let's start with Balochistan. Let's start with Balochistan. Yeah. Uh, as for Balochistan is concerned, the idea at first, when Pakistan came into being, Balochistan didn't decide to join Pakistan at first. Khan of Kallad, and so it, I, there was so, no such thing really as Balochistan back then, right? As yeah. Pakistan, there was the Khanate of Kala. Yeah, right? Khanate of Kala. Yeah. Then there were various tribal regions in Balochistan, yeah. in what is today present-day Balochistan. There was obviously yeah. Fata, right? Yeah. There were considerable, a considerable number of communities that actually lived on the Iran-Pakistan border, right? Yeah. yeah. Wait, and the Khanate of Kala extended into Iran, what is present-day Iran, right? Yeah. yeah. That territory, what happened to that territory? One, which is now part of Iran. Yeah. That that territory is now Iranian Balochistan or what they call it. Yes, and it's Iranian yeah. Balochistan and Pakistani Balochistan. Yeah, yeah. The Irani Balochis and Pakistani Balochis actually recognize the border that was drawn between Iran and Pakistan? Uh, I'm not sure about it, whether they recognize it or not. They don't. They don't recognize the border. The communities have not recognized the border, right? And the the sort of insurrection in Balochistan, which began when you know, uh, it began in sixties, I guess, and then in seventies. It began in nineteen forty-eight. It began yeah. year after partition, the year after independence, and has been ongoing since, right? Since Various, and it has. I mean, there have been various surges of violence and then, you know, sort of calm periods and surges of violence. What are the Balochis primarily revolting against? Why are so, they? Why, what are the Balochis angry about? They are, they are, it's like simple, I think. For example, any ethnic group, Whenever it is, or any sort of a group, whenever it is living in a state, because we are living in a nation state system, they, they are asking for fundamental human rights. Like, for example, they want to live with dignity, they want share in power, 
they want representation yeah, they want wait, 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 wait. so these are all big and large and abstract ideas right but the baluchis want something very specific right and they have been seeking they want something very specific since 1948 right freedom this not got what is freedom again again there is a core, right? aspiration for a different state who but it arises due to certain circumstances some go for secessionist uh, go towards secessionist tendency some wants to integrate some want some other way to, towards the it's issues. not that they want they don't want it's not a question of freedom in some kind of abstract and vague way right they yeah. want very specific things the first thing they want which has they have never received they have they wanted one thing starting in 1948 which has never been fulfilled by any pakistani government never it's never happened and it never will happen and the first that first thing is they want the army to get out right they want the army out of pakistan yes. the army functions primarily today as an occupying power right yes. same in fatah and the the issue in fatah has been more recent yeah right certainly since the talibanization of that region and the actually the end of the afghan war and the pouring of taliban and al qaeda um you know, al qaeda members into pakistan into those tribal regions into into fatah and the army going in to root them out right after experiencing a pretty deadly deadly incursion into swat and having to fight and i mean the army has suffered nobody saying they haven't but why is the army there balochistan right is a part of pakistan why is the army occupying a part of pakistan right because at times they are like a this is like this would be like telling someone right this would be like the you the, the the army in the united kingdom occupying essex or surrey or one of the other counties that right other province in fact you know and it's like unimaginable is it can you imagine a uk or the french army occupying normandy or the us army occupying i don't know kansas it's it's unimaginable right but we're doing it we have our army occupying both sides which is in terms of landmass the largest province right the least populated province probably the wealthiest province in terms of minerals and mineral wealth under the ground right which has been very badly and sporadically and sparsely mined because you can't get in there yeah. why does the army think it needs to sit there since 1948 think about that 72 years the army has been sitting in 71 years we all know that how you know the unimaginable and problematic it is that at times we just can't decipher it that what goes on in the mind of a general when they are doing it like we just can't figure it out right. so can i just say one thing uh, tell me your name by the way sarmad 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 right so other people other than sarmad have to have contribute to this conversation please yeah. it can't yeah. just be sarmad okay. uh, about the army in balochistan don't you think that when we uh, got insurgencies from our uh, neighbors or uh, whatever we say them our enemies or uh, whoever they are so army uh, should go and protect the borders uh, within the cities of balochistan or on the borders of balochistan there is a border within the border uh, alongside iran or the, uh, the coastline where there is navy or uh, there is marine uh, sorry army there or yes. air force forces but the army in balochistan is not protecting the border right it is not protecting pakistani citizens from foreign attack it is occupying balochistan right balochistan is how is it how is it occupying army is in lahore we have control actually we are sitting uh, yes but uh, but the army does the army whenever it feels like it declare curfew in lahore or in karachi or in larkana or in uh, you know nawabsha pindi peshawar does it actually say right 
curb the movement of citizens across a province? If you decided today you wanted to go to Larkana, you wanted to drive to Larkana, right? Can the army stop you from driving to Larkana? They can't. If somebody wanted to go from Gwadar to Quetta, can the army stop that Balochi from driving to from Gwadar to Quetta? Yes. Uh, they are absolutely can. But you know, there, uh, the condition, the condition there, the security situation or uh, the economic situation there is uh, we have uh, what tangible proof. We have tangible proof. Uh, we got, we got spies security? from there. Just what security situation? Uh, like the uh, bomb blast. Like the bomb blast there. The insecurity like the of the province, right, is created by whom? The army or the Velocis? The army. Pretty much. Oh, it's, it's more of a hey, it's more hey, of a propaganda play than anything. Hey, I because think it's I think it's bo uh, both of them uh, playing their uh, as uh, someone said everything is about power. So right. both and as Sarmat said uh, so uh, everyone is uh, trying to grab something uh, from there and uh, they are creating the situation. Yeah, but you're but talking about two wildly unequal forces, right? This is like. You know, the, it's the equivalent is the, pa the Palestinians throwing stones at IDF tanks, right? And IDF tanks turning around and blowing holes in people's houses, right? It's asynchronous, right? It's completely lopsided. What power do the Balochis themselves have in Balochistan? Authority. Do they have autonomy? Can they, can they live their lives as they choose to live their lives, right? And can they elect individuals to their provincial assembly, right? Without any interference from any outside forces. Have they been able to? No, they have not been able to. They have. And I feel like, and I feel like it, that's the main issue here, right? The inability of any sort of political control that the Balochis have is specifically why the army wants to occupy that area because they believe because it, in a very simple way why would you want to make a stronghold anywhere or force all these curfews and all these other sort of laws and things upon any sector is when you're insecure about that that area those people leaving your country or taking their resources away from you or just not being um, of help to you in that sort of way that you right. want to, right? So right. that's so, what the army is secure about. Yes, you're right. But Balochistan used to be an anomaly, right? Balochistan used to be the standalone province that had these problems and these grievances, and Punjab, Sindh, then, uh, KBK, then NWFB didn't have these problems, right? Or allegedly didn't have, right? There was no secessionist movement. There were secessionist movements in Sindh, but they were not nearly so violent as the Balochi movements. There was not nearly the kind of crackdown that happened in Balochistan, did not happen in Sindh, except for one moment when Ayub took power, right? But otherwise, it didn't really happen, right? And the freedom to, the freedom, the multiple freedoms, right? Freedom of association means hanging out with whoever the hell you wanted to hang out, right? with freedom to elect right representatives of your choice as opposed to army enforced or army rigged or army appointed individuals governing you yes well, how many times has Balochistan gone from legislative to governor rule to legislative to governor rule and how many times has this happened governor rule is what Governors are not elected in this country. They're appointed, right? Means somebody appointed by the central government, right? Not somebody elected by the people of that province. Yes? Those are consti there are constitutional mechanisms in which one institutes governor rule, right? Have those mechanisms been properly and faithfully executed? I mean, has there really been a crisis in Balochistan that needed quelling or that needed squashing, that needed to be put down in the way that the army has put it down. Doesn't look like it is. And now, so what you're saying now, and but now it has a momentum of its own, right? Now you're saying both sides are involved in, you know,
know, Bulma and, you know, um, the, each side is violent. Each side has been over the course of 72 years, been picking off each other. But this is completely lopsided, right? The, inter in these, the secessionists and the, insurrector the, the insurrectionists don't have the kind of arms, munition, manpower, right, that the army does. They don't. I mean, it's really quite simple. Then the army today in Pakistan is by far the strongest and the largest institution in our country, right? To the point where the army now thinks it can do whatever it wants. However, so the occupation of Balochistan has led to the abrogation of, abrogation meaning the undermining or the ignoring of what particular rights? What rights do the Balochis not have? At times they don't even have the right to life. Well, given right. that they're being disappeared and, you know, then found three weeks later, you know, a body found in some nala or in some bottom of a ravine or God knows where, right? That's one thing. What else? The right to uh, movement. The right uh, political association. Political, any kind of association, right? When those martial law laws go into effect, you're not allowed to hang out with more, you know, if there are four people, that's, you know, illegal. You can't be in public with four people at the same time. There was such a law, by the way. There is such a law. And it was implemented at certain point years in Pakistan's history. Not Section fair. Right? Section and, Yes, you could go, so suppose you went to a, a, a hotel with your entire family, 24 people in your extended family and had dinner, right? According to the law, when that law is implemented, that's an illegal act. You cannot associate with those, all of those people at the same time, right? Yeah. What, what gets, what, why are, the, why, so what else? What else is being taken away from the people of those things? Uh, like is after 18th amendment a lot of things were promised like provincial autonomy and under it comes a lot of which means that they will be having a lot of uh, fundamental rights that were abrogated at first by or so, were, were dominated by the federation or whatsoever you keep using this word sermon but we still haven't, you haven't defined it what is a fundamental right what is so fundamental about a right that makes it fundamental Inalienable. There's a great line actually. The, I'll come back to that in a bit. So, um, what makes it inalienable? Inalienable. Do you have a copy of the Universal Declaration, any of you, with you? Do you all have? Do you have cell phones? Who wanna? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to just find it. Uh, Uh, so, wait one minute, I just have to find it, because this thing is, this, you know, it's here, it's find it. you, uh, declaration, There's a whole bunch of language in the Universal Declaration, especially in the preamble, right? That a whole bunch of words, and the words are, well, let me read you some of them. Okay. The preamble to the, so firstly, the Declaration of Human Rights is, is only a declaration, right? The whole bunch of member states getting together and saying something. It is not enforceable. It is not binding on any member state who has actually, any member state who has even signed the declaration, right? Does not necessarily have to enforce, right? By law, those rights, to ensure those rights are protected. Declarations are not that, right? The other things, everything that came out of the Universal Declaration 
is enforceable. Okay? So we'll get to that. So the first thing was to make a statement, and the statement was, in many ways, framed, framed and grounded in the experience of two world wars, World War I, World War II. Right? So the Universal Declaration came after World War II, after the larger, horrifying genocide committed by the Nazis came to light, right? And the United Nations was established in order to avoid, right? To avoid any other situ another situation in which a war like the war that they had just gone through could possibly happen, right? That was the larger point of the UN, to not allow the world to slip back into a war like this war. How many people died in World War II, you know? Many millions. Millions, yes, millions. How many millions? No, and we're not talking about people who died from starvation, disease, exposure, not those things, right? Killed either through bombings or on the front or in battle. How many people? From 20 to 40 million something? 60 to 80. Oh. Right? And that figure is 60 to 80. It's a huge, it's a 20 million person yeah. gap, right? Yeah. Is because different people count differently, right? Yeah. Yeah. People actually include in the count different things. If you include, for example, the revolutions and the the revolutions that occurred right after World War II, the most important one being China, right? Yeah. How many people died in the Chinese Revolution? Many. Million. Between 10 and 12 million people, just in that event, which happens right after World War II, right? If you count that, certainly that number expands. Then Chinese Revolution was actually a direct result of World War II. It came out of World War II. Mao, the Maoist revolution had, was a response to China's weakened state, right? Following Japanese occupation for, when did the Japanese start occupying China? Not in 1939. In 1932, 33 is when Japan, and so the world war as the West understands it, 1939 to 1945, right? Is bookended by other wars that were ongoing already when the world war began and wars that continued when the world war ended right so the armistice between the u.s and japan and the allies and germany right did not necessarily end all conflict across the world certainly did not and the one thing that came out of the world war ii was a series of movements global movements right decolonization movements in which nations that had been previously colonized by European powers or by the Ottoman Empire, though not really the Ottoman Empire, that was the breaking up of the World War I, right, gained their independence. And that independence, none of that independence was gained without bloodshed, right? Severe bloodshed, significant bloodshed. 20 to 40 million people, World War I, 60 to 80 World War II. That's an outrageous number. That's half the I mean, that's the half the population of Pakistan. Can you imagine if in a six year period half the population of Pakistan died? Think about that for a second. Right? World War One. The entire current population of Karachi is dead. And then plus more, obviously. The world was a lot less populated back then also. What was the population of Karachi in 1947? What was the population of Karachi in 1947? Karachi was like... It was in Karola. It was in Lex, I think. It was... It has not reached the one crore, I guess. It was approximately 5 million, so 50 lakh. Approximately 5 million. We have quadruple in 70 years, our population. Literally quadruple, right? 
Okay, coming back to why did I get onto the war? Uh -huh, right. So one of the promises of the so I'm going to read some of this. That's what I was doing, right. Um, whereas record, recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable, inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace for our world, right? And a whole bunch of words in there, including things like dignity. What is dignity? Respectable way of living. Yeah. Is that culturally specific? No, not really. A respectable way of living culturally specific? Or it is. It is. A dignified way to live, right? Yes, it is. The way that I live, with the, my assumptions about what a dignified way to live might be, right? And the chaprasi on the streets, assumptions about what a dignified way to live might be, are not the same. Are never going to be the same. My assumptions and somebody's assumptions in, say, Vietnam or in Brazil, not necessarily the same, right? But they're using these words. What is dignity? What is it? Dignity is living with your people, with your history, with your culture, with your language, in your own way. I feel like uh, dignity could also mean not feeling like you live any lesser than anyone else in the rest of the world. So it's yeah. less of an acknowledgement, right, that you as an individual, right, are equal to every single other individual, no matter, right, your wealth, your status, your family background, your religion, your, right, absolutely does not matter, right? And the, so dignity is the acknowledgement that you are a human being equal to any other human being, whether it's you know, um, the president of the nation, whether it's the Allah Khan, whether it's the Queen of England, or whether it's, you know, Mr. Panwala at the corner of PIDC. All right. And so it's not just that equality be established, but that that equality be acknowledged, right? That the acknowledged by institutions, governments, right? both local and global, that this individual is an individual and a human individual and must be treated with the same level of respect, dignity as you treat anybody else, right? No matter what, no matter what, that's the really key part, right? Not just, not just because you have any, you know, some prejudice in your head that says, well, women shouldn't be treated equal to men because women are, of course, a lesser species, right? There is, a, there is that kind of rhetoric that floats around. And therefore, right, women are not conferred certain dignity, a certain respect, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, other words and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. Equal and inalienable. If these rights are equal, equal in the sense that one right does not sit above another right. There is no hierarchy of rights, right? There is no most important right, least important right. That the rights themselves are equal, right? Each has an equivalence to each, every other right. And to say that one is less important than another and therefore I can take this away while giving you this, that doesn't work. That does not cut, right? That does not actually confer dignity on individuals. One, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't have to raise your hand. There's only five of us. Yeah. Uh, so, my, my question was that I've always understood the human rights as 
all of the rights written in the Declaration come from that idea of dignity for the human life itself, right? So whether or not I'm getting education is based on the fact that I am alive and that I have dignity because I'm a human being who's alive. In that sense, don't a lot of states and a lot of countries um, interpret human rights in that way, where they place human life above, the right to human life above all other rights? So the right to privacy or the right to education. Yeah, but this, this document is saying something slightly different, right? It's saying that the right to life without the freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, freedom to associate, there's really no right at all, right? That you simply, all right, so yes, the state confers upon you and acknowledges that you have a right to live, right? But if you have to live in a cage eating dog food, right? That's not a life, do you understand? So even the right to life is equivalent, is equal to every other right. That's part of what this document is trying to say. That no one right is more important than another. No one right can be dispensed with, okay? Equal, right? And inalienable, cannot be othered, cannot be made alien to your body, literally your body, right? So, brings me to the line from Star Trek, which I was going to teach. So, there, when uh, there's a difference, old Star Trek, not new Star Trek, this is the, when the, I think the last Star Trek film, maybe the last Star Trek film from the original cast with, you know, um, and William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy and all of those. Right? And they're in conference with the Klingons. And Kirk quotes, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the moment he gets to the word inalienable, the Klingons bounce on him for being bigoted and a racist because, right, they are aliens. And therefore, right, what does it mean to alienate or a right to be inalienable from an alien, right? That the very word itself is a loaded, complicated term, right? But the point I'm trying to make the larger point I'm trying to make here is that, in fact, this document, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, right, is not a perfect document. And we understand it better today than we did 70 years ago. We understand it better today than even the framers and the makers of the document, the writers of that document, understood it when they wrote it. So it's important for you to understand how this document emerged, right? So in 1948, you had approximately 57 to, I think it was 50, 56, 57 member states in the United Nations. When the Universal Declaration was put up for a vote, right? Today there are how many member states in the United Nations? 160 plus, 180 almost, with a number of states with observer status, but no voting status, who are not necessarily member states yet and certain states that are not member states because they do not have functioning governments, like Somalia, for example. But, right, can you imagine getting 47, yeah, sorry, huh, 47, that's what it was, 47 member states to agree on a document like this? What had to happen? The drafting committee spent a year drafting the whole thing. And then they took it to the general, the, to the general assembly, and the general assembly voted, but they didn't vote on the document as a whole until they had voted on every word in every sentence of that document. And if there was significant disagreement, the drafters went back to committee, and they looked at all the options presented. And they came back with, an, with something that they thought they could, be, they could reach consensus on. They really wanted a unanimous vote. Okay. What countries have not signed the Universal Declaration or not actually acknowledged even that the Universal Declaration applies to them? Still, today, to this day, not. Saudi Arabia. Hmm? Saudi Arabia. 
Saudi is one of them. Iran, Iran, I guess. Iran signed. Iran signed even before the Shah was instituted. This, you know, this was when the which when Mossadegh became prime minister in 1953. So, Singapore, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, a number of island nations that have not signed on, right? The majority of member states in the, in the world have signed up, right? Oh, the Qatar, not. Um, a couple of other ones, I can't remember which one. So, they go into committee, right? How did, the, how did the United Nations understand this document? What, why is this document so important to not just global peace and global harmony and the governance of citizens within an individual state, but for the United Nations itself. Why is this document so important? I feel like because it gives a framework to how we want to go about doing things, right? It, like, it doesn't tell you what to do, but it gives you what to strive towards or what to achieve. For the United Nations, this is seen as a founding document. Founding document. And a founding document, right, articulates a framework within which an institution or an organization will operate. Okay? Human rights doctrine, the idea of conferring and protecting human rights is central to every single thing the United Nations is supposed to do. Every single thing. If a particular course of action taken by the United Nations ends up violating human rights, the United Nations by charter cannot engage it. You understand? One of the drafters, it's a political thinker and philosopher named Rene Cassin, C A S I N, right? Understood the Universal Declaration, saw it as a piece of architecture. He saw it as the house within which the United Nations sat. Okay. So he literally saw it as a scaffolding, as a structure. And he designated certain rights for this pillar and certain rights for that pillar and that and that. And these were the, you know, the preamble was the steps leading up to the portico and the portico was the falana, falana. But I mean, he had this whole pretty elaborate description. I can read it to you tonight. But the point is that he saw human rights as a house, right? He saw it as a building, as a structure. And he saw the gathering of individual nations together to arrive at consensus about moving the world forward, right? As operating within the framework, within the scaffolding of human rights stuff. That if it didn't happen within that framework, right? It had no business in the United Nations. Okay? That makes sense to you? This is, I mean, yes? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Okay. And the doctrine that they developed, right, primarily led by this indefatigable and brilliant woman, right? You all know this story. Who was the chair of the committee that actually drafted the document? Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, right? She, political in her own right, internationally political in her own right, after FDR's death, worked with the UN and primarily, and this was her thing. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for the most part, is Eleanor Roosevelt's baby. Without her, this would never have happened, okay? And her, what she wanted to, her, the framework from which she, what she brought to the table was, was a very famous speech given by her husband about five years earlier, by FDR, during the war, right? in which Roosevelt talked about two different kinds of freedoms, right? He talked about negative freedoms and positive freedoms. You know what the difference between a negative freedom and a positive freedom is? Some more. Like, okay. um, for example, negative freedoms are like, which are harmful for myself, but I am enjoying unless they are not harming anyone else. Like, yes. I am smoking cigarette, and 
Yeah, no, yeah, but but you know, yeah. you sort of, negative freedom is not the negative in that sense. It's not negative in that it's a bad thing for you, but you know, it's not really harming anybody else, and it really is harming other people because secondhand yeah, smoke is real danger. Um, so, and you know, I'm saying this, and I'm and I smoke, and I've been smoking for forty years, so um, and thirty nine years. Um, so, <laughs> right, but that's not what quite it, well, what it is quite right. So. Roosevelt articulated this. I'm going to have to look up because I'll never remember it. Um, so Roosevelt articulated two different kinds of freedoms, right? One negative, one positive, and uh, where is it? Uh, I just have to find. He gave the speech. It was a speech during wartime that he gave to Congress, in which he. Where is it? Uh, Oh, okay. I'm sorry, you know, I used, I have a whole big file with all of my human rights documents, hard copies of everything, and I've been searching for that file for the past four days and I have not been able to find it. So everything now I have to go and hunt in books, which I apologize. Um, uh, not to Franklin, Four Freedom, here we go. So it was a speech called the Four Freedom Speech that he gave. And in it, he says this, uh, for Um, uh, the first freedom, right? the four freedoms that Roosevelt talked about freedom of speech and expression okay? everywhere in the world. That means you should be free to. Say what you want, when you want, wherever you want, no matter, right, how critical it is of a political institution, social institution, cultural institution, individual, political leader, etc., etc. Freedom of expression, freedom of speech, one, right? The second is a freedom of every person to worship God in his own way, freedom of religion, right? These are positive, negative. The freedom of religion is a negative? These are positive freedoms, right? You have the freedom to do this, right? In the sense that it confers on you, says to you, right? This is the right. This is an inalienable right, right? You cannot remove it from your body, right? What you believe, how you believe, how you worship, right? What you think and how you express, where you express, what you express, protected always. Always. Right? So, in the Thar Desert, in Sin, interior Sin and in Thar, right? One of the biggest challenges, right, has been in recent years, but pretty much consistently, but in recent years, the forced conversion of Hindus and Christians, right, across Sin, primarily in the Thai region, but across Sin, Lower Punjab, right, forced conversion. That legal? Can somebody force you to convert to another religion? They can, but they don't want to. They shouldn't. Does the government of Pakistan force individuals to convert to another religion? They should have. Do they? Legally? Um, yes, yes, they do. Yes, yes, they do. In certain circumstances, in certain situations, the government of Pakistan, the law of the country, the law of the land, specifies, says, that you, as a non-Muslim, to become a Muslim. In order to do this, you have to become a Muslim. You know what that is? Yeah. Marry a Muslim. Suppose you're a non-Muslim, you want to marry a Muslim. You cannot legally, in this country, retain your religion. You can't do it. It's illegal to do that. If you're a Muslim in this country, and you decide to renounce your faith, and convert to Christianity or 
Who is them? Can't be gone by soon, unfortunately, but you just can't. Because they don't, we don't allow conversion. In any case, right? Can you do it as a Muslim? Can you convert to another religion? No, we can't even call ourselves atheists for that matter. Publicly. <laughs> Yeah. You can't call yourself that. Nobody's going to do anything about it if you do. Yeah, but you can't like just put it officially somewhere out there. You can know? you go yeah. to yeah, that would be temple and convert? Go through a ceremony that actually says, designates you now as Hindu. Can you as a Muslim do that and not get put in jail? No. You can't do that. You can't do it. Really it's not allowed. This is so now. Is that a violation of your fundamental human rights as Muslims, as individuals? Yes. Of course it is. That's a violation of your right. The forced conversion of Hindus is not a violation of their rights until the government sanctions. Once the government says this is okay, you can go ahead and do it. We're not going to prosecute you, which is de facto what they do, right? But the penal code. Pro pro prohibits it, prevents that from happening, right? Okay. Well, all right, so four freedoms. The third freedom, freedom from want. Want in this sense means need, right? You should be free from needing things, food, water, Mr. Bhutto, Roti, Kapra, Makan, right? And the fourth freedom, freedom from fear, right? You should not be afraid. You should not live in your home, in your country, as a citizen of that nation, afraid. You should, that the state should provide adequate safety, protection and safety, so that you may go about your daily life without worrying that you're going to get shot in a drive-by motorbike, you know, craziness, or you're going to get caught up in a bomb blast, or you're going to get picked up by the army and disappear, or, right, or some thug decides that he doesn't like you, doesn't like your shakal, and come to the union, to your house and shoot you dead. Right? Targeted killings. You should be, right? So those are the those are the negative freedoms. Freedom from want, right? Should not, so the way he defines it is, uh, okay. uh, means economic, understandings which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants, right? This is an economic stipulation. Freedom from fear, right? Uh, a worldwide reduction of armaments to such a, to such a point and to such a, in such a thorough fa fa fashion that no nation will be in a position of an act of physical aggression against any neighbor, right? Freedom from fear. Roosevelt's talking about it in armed military conflict terms, right? But it translates into your ability to be in a particular location without having to look over your shoulder or be paranoid all the time, right? Do we live in that environment? No. <laughs> Not, right? Yeah. So the difference between a positive freedom and a negative freedom, right? is a positive freedom is something you possess, right? That is, a negative freedom is something that you don't possess, but you don't want, right? Freedom from this, right? To be, it's almost like in Urdu you would say, chukye, right? It, I'm free of fear, right? Dharne se, my Urdu is really terrible, but anyway, dharne se chukye, as it is. Does it make sense? Okay. So, Freedoms understood in the doctrine, in human rights doctrine, right, is understood in these four large ways, right? Speech, expression, belief, right? So what does it mean to say 
freedom to worship God in whatever way you choose. Freedom of beliefs. I have a question here. Uh, that the freedom you are talking about is it absolute or it uh, it should have these some limits? Absolute. These are these are absolutes, right? Uh, you have the right. You have the right to believe and to practice your faith, right? With no curtailment, the government, the state, the community around you, the citizens who you live next door to, cannot uh, come in and say to you. You cannot worship in that way. Let's, uh, let's talk about the first freedom, the freedom of expression or speech. Yes. Uh, we are not allowed to say certain things. Uh, yes. Like you cannot, uh, you cannot preach or because yeah, uh, like you cannot preach anti-Semitism. Uh, no, Semitism. Uh, you cannot uh, uh, preach anti-Semitism, or you cannot uh, in our country you cannot uh, commit uh, preach. Anti-Islam, something like that, which commits blasphemy. Right. Uh, uh, there's a saying I don't know who said it, but I quote that your freedom ends where my nose, uh, where uh, my nose, uh, my nose, something like uh, your freedom uh, ends where my freedom begins, basically. Uh, it. Right. Yeah, it is like yeah. that. So, uh, but it's not. But, but is it but contradictory to what you're saying that a freedom is absolute? Well, again, but, well, in this country, the laws. Right, are formulated in a way that prohibits us from saying and doing certain things. Right? Not that does not mean, that all, does of, not all over the world. All no, it's not all over the world. It's not uh, nearly all over the world. Excuse me. You cannot, I, you cannot, I can uh, walk into a church in Hold on. I can walk into a church anywhere in Europe or in the U.S. and say, you know, fuck Jesus, if I want to, and nobody can do anything about it. Cannot be arrested. Cannot be fined. Cannot be, you know, nothing. Uh, you can, uh, you cannot I can uh, deny. Uh, whenever I want, whenever I want, good. and as loudly as I want, wherever I want, in England, in France, in Germany, in Spain, in Italy, all of these very devout Catholic countries, absolutely. Brazil, Venezuela, Argentina can say it if I want to. Mexico, the U.S., Canada, Australia. If I want to say it, Japan. If uh, I want to say, so, if I want so to so say so something. I'm going to come back to that. Get, right? So what you're saying, this is very specific to Muslim countries, Islamic countries. It is not specific to anywhere else. There are no blasphemy laws in, for example, Switzerland. And I use Switzerland because Switzerland, for a significant chunk of its modern history, was a devout Calvinist Protestant state, right? Geneva, Geneva under Calvin and under the Calvinists, the Protestants, was like Kabul under the Taliban, but without the Kalashnikovs, right? That was in the 17th, 18th century. If you said something contrary to the Bible, or against the prophet, or against God, you could absolutely be imprisoned, punished, fined, tortured. Absolutely. Can't do it today. Absolutely cannot do it today. Even in a place like Ireland, which is devoutly Catholic, okay? and perhaps one of the most conservatively Catholic countries in Europe. You can say whatever you want. Yeah, That's uh, what of expression means, right? Yeah. Uh, as you said, like countries like most of the Muslim world does not have those freedoms which the European world or the West is enjoying, or what we can say, or or we can say that we have they have a relatively more freedom than us, or they are relatively more free than us to express themselves. Well, it depends. It depends on how you're defining freedom and what aspect of freedom you are I, examining, right? The Western as, world, in certain aspects, is not more free than us. Of course, of course, of course. And as far as like, as you said, it is the problem of the whole Muslim world, not just whole Muslim world. I think other parts of the third world too. Like it's even not a can, single majority Muslim nation that does not have some form of a blasphemy law in its penal code, not one. Yeah, of course, like they have. 
it's there. The point, the point I'm trying to make here is that what you think that, okay, we are in this situation right now. What is the cause of it? Do you diagnose the problem as, for example, those states achieve secularism or we are not secular? Or it is something else beyond Secular is one of those words that is so badly misused yeah. in our contemporary yeah. context that I would really so prefer to don't use secular in this context, right? Even in the context of Enlightenment Europe, when secularism was allegedly, right, allegedly um, started to spread across nations in Europe, right, every one of the major Enlightenment philosophers, right, believed in God, every single one of them. And they all made arguments for the existence of or non-existence of, right? They all were grounded in a Christian metaphysical ethic, right? They derived moral laws from that Christian ethic. Secularism, as we understand it today, is something so divorced from the history yeah. of secularism as it developed, right? Yeah. Secularism as a political idea is very different from secularism as an individual tenet or faith, right? Individual set of beliefs. As a political idea, secularism is what? Like, in general, as we know, like, they say, like, it is like separation of state and church or... But, but I... But how I the see it, state cannot influence, the religion cannot influence the state. Yeah, religion cannot influence. But the state can also not influence religion. That these are two yeah. distinct areas of human activity. The state is secular. That does not mean that the individuals who live in that state, the citizens of that state, are secular. Yeah. But the state treats all in individuals equally in that secular context, right? Because as for, because to treat citizens equally means to acknowledge individual professions of faith and individual practices of faith, right? As equal and equally protected. Yeah. That means that the state has to be secular in order to protect all of the religions, of all of the citizens that exist within that state, right? According to the Indian constitution, the difference between the Indian constitution and the Pakistani constitution is exactly this, right? The Indian constitution specifically states that the state will not get involved in the business of religion, will not. The Pakistani constitution does not say that at all, right? Pakistani constitution begins by saying what? Yeah, yeah, First line yeah. of the preamble of the constitution. Sovereignty belongs to, to Almighty Allah. Yeah. It's exercised by the people. And uh, the, the land has been conferred on Muslims by him. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, forget about all the other people who live here. Right? God gave the Muslims this land, Pakistan. Yeah. Right? And then there is a note in the preamble, which is what the law resolution was essentially, right? That says that minorities and minorities in this country are only defined by religion, right? Only defined legally by religion, right? You are a minority if you are not what? Not Muslim. Muslim. Allegedly Muslim, but really it's Sunni Muslim, right? If you're a minority, right, you are protected in the constitution, you are protected, right, to worship the way you want to, right, yes, and the state cannot interfere in your fashion or practice or profession of faith, whatever it is, profession of belief, because the constitution gives me, as a Parsi, that right to be able to practice my religion the way I want to, right, without the interference of the state. But the constitution also tells me I'm a second class citizen. Because one, I was not one of the people who benefited from God's munificence in bestowing land on the Muslims of Pakistan, one. Right? Two, right? I do not hold the same status in this nation as Muslims. 
Do I have the same standards? No. I don't. What can you do that I can't do? I can be the Prime Minister of Pakistan, but you can't. There you go. Or? Justice of the Supreme Court. Or? President. The president, uh, uh, the army chief, or, or the well, chief of army. I, can't spread my religion I cannot hold certain political positions simply because of my faith, because of the accident of birth that I was born into a Parsi family, whereas you were not. Right? Is that honoring human rights doctrine as? Right? Is that does that say? It? Does that tell you, does that say each of these people who live in this country are equal and equal before the law and equally respected and their dignity is maintained and upheld by the state? Do you say that? No. Uh, isn't it the same case uh, with the United Kingdom? If we talk about the religion, uh, Catholic cannot be a king or the queen. Cannot be a king. King. Right? No, it actually, it's not that a Catholic cannot be a king. There have been Catholic monarchs. Okay. Before there Henry, have been. Before no, Henry. Even, after, yeah. even after. So, um, James the First, James, James the First, Charles the First, Charles the Second, James the Second, Queen Anne, all Catholics. They all came uh, after Henry, not Queen Henry after Elizabeth. Mary, Henry's daughter. Henry VIII's daughter, Mary, Queen Mary, was a Catholic. And she actually tried to undo what her father had done and reinstate the Catholic Church in England. And she failed miserably. Right? There have been Catholic... And, all right. Albert. Prince Albert. No, not Albert. The, there have been other Catholic monarchs, actually consort wives or husbands of English monarchs who have been Catholic. Okay. That's not an issue. So it's no longer an issue. And now in England, it's not even an issue. You don't even have to be a, you don't even have to be a male heir, right? You don't have to. The firstborn child is now the heir to the throne. So the heir to the English throne after which one? William, right? Is his daughter, the firstborn child or the girl. She will be the next queen after he will. They will not. They will not simply go down to the firstborn son anymore. So countries change, right? Countries change their laws, and it doesn't really matter because the king, the queen, and king of England, the constitutional monarchy, they really don't have any authority, any, zero authority. They open parliament. And they invite the elected prime minister to form a government, invite him to form, but they have no authority at all. In constitutional monarchies, People have no authority. They mean the royalty have no authority. Not like, you know, MBS. Ha. In Saudi, you know what I'm talking about, right? Can't simply go around, you know, killing journalists in your own embassy and then chopping them into pieces and scattering them wherever you want, right? Not that kind of monarchy anymore, though Saudi seems. Very different. Secular constitutional monarchies in, the, in Europe, right, function differently. And there are many of them. Belgium, the Netherlands. Sweden, nor uh, not Norway, um, um, uh, Hungary. Uh, these are all constitutional monarchies. Their monarchs are still in place. They also have parliaments and elections and etc. Yeah. Are we a Commonwealth nation, Pakistan? Are we a Commonwealth? Is Pakistan a Commonwealth nation? No, I mean, and this will come back to something that has to do with human rights. All British, former British colonies were invited to be part of what the British called the Commonwealth of Nations, right? The Commonwealth of Nations, right? Because we were all once ruled by right? our queen, Apri Rani. That's what the Parsis used to say, Apri Rani and Apri Raja. Even if you know Gujarati, that means my king and my queen. Um, if we are a member of the Commonwealth of Nations, right? What is the one thing that the Commonwealth of Nations has in common? That's 
We acknowledge the Queen of England or the King of England as our titular ruler. That is what the, one of the stipulations of the Commonwealth. So officially, we acknowledge Queen Elizabeth II as our queen. Officially. All Commonwealth nations are supposed to do that. Many Commonwealth nations have written into their right their charters or whatever the whatever document they actually put together. Right? have said specifically everything but that, right? We don't acknowledge her as our queen, but we are a member of the Commonwealth. Why do we do that? Why don't we simply acknowledge Elizabeth as our queen? For the longest time, we had an empress, right? Victoria was an empress, which is why the market is called that, empress market. You all, you all know what empress market is? None of you know what empress market is? No, uh, Empress Market is the big, the central big market in Karachi, and it's called Empress Market because the full name is Empress Victoria Market. Okay. Here we have Empress Road, I guess. Yeah, Empress Road in Lahore. We have a lot of things in Lahore, and in Lahore, but there's tons. Of, there's still in Lahore actually a lot of colonial heritage and a colonial traces history, right? Karachi. Yeah. Rachito, Vian, are you changing your road names as well? Has Lahore changed all its road names? Yeah, Made them all into Muslim names as opposed to English names? Yeah. Yeah. Even our institution from which we are coming from, the government college Lahore, it is a colonial remnant that we are having. Yeah, sure. But 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 former Christian hasn't changed its name, right? Any number of Christian institutions in Lahore or English institutions in Lahore still exist, right? Yeah. Some things have changed. That all the statues that used to line the the mall, mall have been, you know, removed, forcibly removed. Some of them are in the museum. Some of them were broken and destroyed beyond, you know, beyond salvageability. But in the context of rights, okay, how did we get to the heart? Right? You said, right? We're talking about secular, and we're talking about laws that prohibit or curtail certain kinds of speech. This is how we got here, right? We have any number of laws that specifically state that we cannot say all sorts of things. We cannot speak critically of the Supreme Court. Yeah. Yeah. We cannot speak critically of our government. We cannot speak critically of our army. Are these laws are these actually laws in our penal code? Uh, not I guess explicitly. Not, uh, not explicitly. Like, they are not in our penal code. They're not. Right? Yeah, like not, that, not explicitly. When the Chief Justice went on a rampage a, couple, a year and a half ago and told everyone that if anybody spoke out against the Yammer and the dam projects that they would be right arrested and tried for treason. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that a law? Of course not. No. It, it's not even in room. It cannot even be a law. Why can't those laws exist? Why? Why can there be no law in Pakistan that specifically says you cannot criticize the army or you cannot criticize your government? Well, you already can't. Hmm? Because you already can't, <laughs> I guess. I, it's not a question of you already can't. You can already not do it only if it's a law. If there is no law, you are free to do it. Yeah. But it, it, it's, it's because it's a violation. So it's not in the Pakistan is curtailing your freedom of expression by saying you cannot speak badly of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. That's not what it's saying. So why don't we? Why can't you? For the general environment or the fear that is created yeah. in our society that we just can't say a certain thing. So, you are, you say, so if you you are scared to say something like that, right? Yeah. That's what Roosevelt means when he's talking about freedom from fear. Yeah. Right? So the freedom to say something, your freedom of speech is intimately connected to the negative freedom from fear. Yeah. Because if you are free from fear, you will have the guts 
current, whatever. Stand up and say what you want to say, right? Yes? However, given that we all live in constant fear that we're going to say something stupid or something is going to come out of our mouths and some idiot on the street is going to get, you know, half of what we said and turn it into an FIR that will then go to, you know, and get picked up for whatever, whatever, right? That's what we live in fear of, right? Yes? How many of you drive at night? Like after 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night? One person. Why don't you? I don't have my own car, but I'm usually with the driver. If you did, would you drive at night after 11, 30, 12 o'clock in Lahore? Unless you were going to the airport or you were going, you know, a specific designated thing. Hospital. Yeah, I would. At times I have to. Okay. Yeah. Do you do it with an easy heart? Do you just say, oh, I have to go there. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to get in my car and go. There's like peer pressure, but yeah, like I'm not scared or anything, so I can. I, I wouldn't feel safe. Wouldn't feel safe. It's okay. like slipping and crouching. Today, I would not feel. It's better now. It's actually much, much better, right? But now, what we have to worry about is not the carjacking. What we have to worry about is the asshole mobile units that are going to come and extort money from us simply because they can. Yeah. 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 So the fear, right, when Roosevelt talks about a freedom from fear, he's talking about the ability, our ability to live our lives, right, without, right, constantly having to second guess our activities because somebody might threaten us or somebody might cur curtail or curtail our movement or, right, Kidnap us, carjack us, extort us for cash, whatever, right? If a mobile unit stops you on the street, does it have to have a reason to stop when you're driving or if you're walking? Do they have to have a reason to stop you? They're supposed to have a reason. They usually don't. But they usually don't. Or they, they might be equipped with weapons. What kind of reason do they have to be given? What I'm trying to do is trying to get you to understand human rights and human rights doctrine not as a set of big abstract terms and ideas, right? But a set of a set of ideas that have significant practical value, resonance, and significance, right? Freedom from fear. Freedom from fear is crucial because without that, what do we have? If we are afraid all the time to say what we think, to go where we want, to hang out with whom we want, right? If we are constantly afraid, are we living a life that we ourselves are owners of? Right? Do we own our own lives at that point? Clearly not, right? It is even worse for women if we talk about further. Yeah. Yes, much worse. Much, much worse. Right? Because in a sense, you are constantly on edge. You are, And it doesn't have to be done nighttime or dark, right? It can be any time of the day. Yes. Yeah. I don't think guys in this country really understand what that's like. To live 24-7 with the fear that you are going to be attacked, right? Insulted, humiliated, yes, in any number of ways. And when you demand that you be treated with dignity and respect, what do you get in return? What happened with the audit march? Right? How much invective, how much gali karori from guys, from men? Simply because women stood up and said, we are citizens as well, equal to all of you. We are owed these things. These rights are ours as much as yours. And what did they get for saying any of those things? A whole lot of trouble, right? 
freedom from want. The two negative reasons, right? What is freedom from want? It's the freedom of not needing things, as in having access to things that are necessary for your life. The economic ability to access them, right? The money to. You have a stable economic foundation, right? Freedom from want. You should not have to worry about when you're going to eat again because you don't have the money to buy food or that you don't have the money enough to buy for your children to buy food, right? Yes? If you don't have that, if, you, if you're not free from those kinds of needs, right? Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, whatever those things are. You, what happens if you don't have that? If you don't have food, water, shelter, safety, freedom from warmth, clothing, warmth, warmth as in, you know, inside your house, warmth so that you're not freezing to death. Have I been going two hours? It's Namaste. All right. Sorry, I've been going on and on and we haven't even really got to the rights. <laughs> it's difficult. Um, do you understand what I'm trying to say, right? So the four freedoms, the four freedoms are really important. And this is what I'm trying to get at is Roosevelt's idea about these four freedoms, right? Freedom from want, freedom from right, freedom from fear, right? No fear, no no want. No and freedom to speak, mind, expression, and speech. Belief. Belief is not just about religion, right? The freedom to believe is really the freedom to believe what you want, right? If you really, truly want to believe that cars can run on money, go ahead and believe it. Nobody can prosecute you for thinking stupidly, right? But it's not just that, it's to hold an opinion. Right? To believe, to have an opinion about something. Suppose you have an opinion about the constitution of Pakistan, and that opinion is negative and critical. Should you be allowed to have that opinion? Or should you have to move somewhere else? Go back to where you can't say, go back to where you came from. But can certainly, right? Say, well, if you don't like it, leave the country. If you were born here, grew up here, have a passport, green passport, right? Should anybody be able to say that to you? Right? So freedom of belief, right, is more than just the freedom to practice your faith. You understand? And the freedom, so belief, what you think and expression, what you say, right? Protected, completely protected, right? For fundamental, everything else, every other right that we might have builds from that, okay? I want to say one more thing, which is actually the most important part of all of this. And this is something that the UN Declaration and UN Covenants and Conventions have never addressed never actually addressed. This was addressed by a German philosopher named Hannah Arendt. Do you all know who Hannah Arendt is? Right. Yeah. So Hannah Arendt had the remarkable insight that in the current political formulation of the world, political structure of the world, right? Before you can have any rights, before you have any rights, you have to have the right to have rights. What does that mean? Afghan refugees on the Pakistani border, Guatemalan refugees on the Mexican border, right? Syrians, Iraqis, right? Congolese, Rwandans, displaced peoples, stateless people, right? People without states. Do they have rights? They ought to have rights, they should have rights. Yeah. But they don't. Because the way human rights doctrine kind of works in the world today is that you have to actually belong to a state. And the state has to confer those rights upon you. The state says you have these rights. If you don't belong to a state, right, 
you are essentially stateless. You are a refugee, right? You lose the right to have rights, okay? The biggest challenge for human rights doctrine and for human rights work today, far none, is this, this problem, right? Is that there is no definition, there is a convention on refugees and the rights of refugees. Right now, the UN has one. Not everybody signed it, okay? But the stateless person today, how many people, how many million people in the world today are refugees, you know? Today, there was, actually I just read it two days ago. So 72 million refugees in the world today, 72 million, okay? Doesn't sound like a lot given the number of billions of people that live in the world, right? But that number over the next 30 years is going to increase exponentially. Why? Because of maybe um, more and more crisis situations. For example, if it is in Middle East, there is war going on or violence going on. More basic than that. Malia and I will be refugees in 30 years. At times, climate, climate changes. Climate change is going to create an entire globe full of refugees. In turn, we'll be IDPs, we'll be internally displaced persons, right? But the moment we are internally displaced, right? The moment we do not belong to a, 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 to a district, a, right? We are not part of a community, but we are a community that has been uprooted and shifted, moved somewhere else. We lose those rights. We lose all the rights that the government confers on us. We become essentially refugees, even if we are internally displaced. How many of the IDPs from the floods have actually settled, managed, Afghan refugees still sitting in those tents, right? In those big camps. Do they have rights? Does the Pakistani government confer rights on them? Not really. And the path to citizenship for many of those, many of these Afghan refugees were born in Pakistan, right? Grew up in Pakistan, went to school in Pakistan, have bought property, have started businesses, are essentially Pakistani, but they have no rights because they are not considered Pakistani by the Pakistani government. They are refugees. And the moment the Pakistani government wants to ship them out, they will. What did India just do? Not about the, not not in terms of Kashmir, but what have they been doing in West Bengal, uh, East Bengal for the past, no, sorry, West Bengal for the past 20 years? They have been forcing poor Bengal, poor, poor province, not particularly wealthy, not particularly affluent, not particularly developed, right? Populated by mostly Muslims, right? The Indian government has consistently forced these people to demonstrate their citizenship, right? It's like going to, I don't know, somewhere in the middle of KPK or in the middle of uh, Pakistan in some tiny little village on the foot of Palana Mountain and saying, show me your proof of citizenship. And if you can't prove that you are a citizen, right, you have to get out. You have to get out of the country. All right, so I'm really sorry, guys. We're a little over time, and that's probably because of the, like, our limitations in terms of yeah. weather conditions on your end. And thank you so much for coming here and you know, putting up with all of that. I just hope that this was a very thought-provoking session for you guys and for Dr. Pramji. Like, I hope that he enjoyed talking to you guys as well. Um, we'll have to wrap up here because you know it's raining on your end. So, yeah, so we are very thankful to you. Yeah. What I'm saying about the, about the problem of rights and the problem of rights in nation states and yeah. the, yeah, we do understand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a, la a last thing I would like to say is that uh, I wanted it to be discussed, so but we don't have much time. But don't you think, maybe some other time, but don't you think that how the idea of 
the, all these modern ideas like through enlightenment modernity that inspired the ideas of human rights and nation states even how they how the modernity as such is experience or has interacted with the third world has it's not just about enlightenment and modernity and the third world there is there are documents that emerge from you know from muslim societies from buddhist societies that are central that are pillars of human rights uh, yeah. the charter of uh, charter of medina right yeah yeah that is a human rights document because it acknowledges the fact that there are others who live in this in medina other than muslims and it yeah. confers on them certain rights does it not the cyrus cylinder the very famous cyrus cylinder which is really not a rights document though it does actually curb and put limitations on state power vis-a-vis -vis citizens or aristocrats for the most part right so it's not just right Con the confucius confucian doctrine is fully imbued with human rights issues right so it's not just about the west right there is a lot and islam right one of the central tenets of islam is that every individual in the ummah is equal is it not treated equal and that was the big threat to hinduism that islam posed right that was i mean in a sense because hinduism is structured hierarchically right the religion is structured hierarchically and islam is not yeah you need a movie you have to go to a masjid then you know pray in a masjid with a movie you can pray anywhere you can speak to your god anywhere you do not need an intermediary someone between you and your god right yeah. that was the bit that was the revolution the protestant revolution was about that part right so it's not to don't make this mistake right the mistake is to assume that human rights doctrine is a particularly western idea it is absolutely not it just so happens that the language of human rights has emerged in a western philosophical discourse right and the two revolutions that occurred in the 18th century the french and the the us that the documents that those revolutions produced became in many ways kind of foundational documents for human rights in the 20th century but absolutely not just a western idea right? yeah. yeah of course yeah. Yeah. So i guess for you for you being a human it should be enough to you know fall under human rights and not belong even if you do not belong you're still a human and you know yes. you should Right, but, but it's a modernized idea to belong. I guess it's just scaling up and not. Who has it? So, if you're a refugee, right? The way in which nation states work, right? Nation states work in relation to each other as. Right. Well, let me rephrase that. You're a Pakistani, right? Pakistani government is interested or is. empowered to protect your interests as a pakistani and to place you on a hierarchical level above citizens of any other nation in the world right as pakistani citizens we should get favored favored status or we should get some kind of favored consideration by the government of our nation right yeah yes but we do that's how nation states work right do american presidents think an american life is worth more than a life anywhere else in the world certainly donald trump does but so did bill clinton so did obama right nation states allow governments to make certain exceptional exceptionalist claims right that we are better we are more important we are more worth preserving then right and we will fight this government will fight for the rights of the citizens of this nation right and not for anybody else and if other people in the world suffer because of what we do right it's not our concern 
the ground reality of it is very different actually you know they fighting for their people it's it's not actually like that so does that mean that the very idea or notion of nationhood is contradictory to human rights and at least it is well yeah. that's an argument that's an argument that people should have are having have had right the debate um the un was established in four nation states to arbitrate work out through debate discussion and argument their differences so that exactly this kind of exceptionalism would not right govern or dictate policy or ultimately right relations among the nations but unfortunately the political you know the political structures of the un have failed us in many ways the un has done some amazing work and i know people get down on the un people criticize the un but the united nations given what it is and given that it functions at the behest of its member nations right that it gets anything done is kind of amazing that 47 delegates sat in a room and debated and arrived at consensus about every single word in the universal declaration of human rights which took 6 months to pass because this is what they did that's kind of amazing right that people can sit in a room and arrive at an agreement about something like this language do you know how hard that is you know how hard it is to do something like that yeah any of you ever tried to do with all of your classmates sit in a room and hammer out policy where the language of the policy is something every single one of you agree on so we done model you in debates so we have the idea it's yeah, not that model what you do as model you and is something quite different from what this is right but i used to, when i was teaching in the us I, when i taught at dartmouth dartmouth college dartmouth is one of the very few us institutions in which the faculty at the, the faculty are completely empowered we make policy we write the rules academic policy faculty make that right and what we do is we sit in a room and we that is this we debate every word in a policy statement and every article of that policy statement and we arrive at consensus and we vote and we vote and we vote until we're there until we reach consensus and it's an arduous difficult painful process but it can happen it has happened right it's not governance by fiat right governance by fiat saying you non con saying this and not that right guys i'm really sorry we have, have to, to go we have to put a pin in it i hope that we can have another one of these sessions and i'm so really sorry if you want to continue we can we can continue another time yeah. we can talk about sure. Sure. yeah a larger thing to do this one more if you understand human rights right human rights are these large abstract terms abstract statements but there are very human stories that are involved in human rights stuff right the issue is to understand the abstract terminology so that you can actually tell the human story the human story in which the human and sometimes it's not even anybody's fault that individuals get caught or you know slip through cracks in human rights law aren't protected aren't right, given rights because any number of reasons converge in order to put that person in the position that he or she is in but it's about the human stories that actually right live inside human rights stuff those are the stories you want to get at but you have to understand what it is before you can get to the you know the material practical flesh and blood issue thank you thank you so much thank you so much thank you did that help you think about it yeah you have a lot of concepts that i've had not thought about or did you cut down yeah like just not thought about or ha- hadn't considered yeah so you all should go out and order this actually if you go to sawad and you go to say book bank they have copies of this it's sitting on the one of the back the shelves in the back so if you go to sawad get this
it's a book that you will, if you are interested in human rights law, this is essential, really essential. It has every single, con when, when this published, up to that publishing date, every single convention, covenant declaration from the United Nations. This is 2010, my copy. All right, guys, we're gonna sign out. Bye-bye.